I 26, female and my husband 35, male just moved into a small suburban town in rural Washington. It was nice there, and the house we purchased was quite large for our family size, having just one child a daughter 5 and a dog. We lived near a park where my daughter and dog liked to play. Now on to the actual story. Our neighbor was crazy. She frequently stole things from us when we weren't looking, such as our books, flowers from our garden, and even, at one point, our porch swing. With everything missing and not knowing she was the one stealing, I decided to buy one of those doorbells with a camera to track what was happening. Additionally, I asked other neighbors if this happened to them, and they gave the same responses. Yes, things go missing all the time, and things just vanish. So, with this new doorbell, I was able to see not only my front porch, but also other lawns to help out the neighbors too. On this particular day, I remember it being very rainy, to the point where the sky was pitch black. My daughter loved to jump in puddles, so when she asked to go outside, I said yes, making sure to watch the doorbell in case she needed to come inside. This is when it happened. My neighbor, dressed in a large black raincoat and black winter hat, ran up from behind my child and took her into her house. It happened in a matter of seconds. I didn't even realize what had happened because I was talking to my husband while sitting on the couch. When I called my daughter inside, I got no response. I was confused. What had just happened to her? I went out into the rain and saw her nowhere. I screamed and called 911. She was filed as missing two days later. I was deep in regret unable to help my only child. I remember scrolling on my phone and seeing the doorbell app. Wait, I thought, I can see exactly what happened on this. I opened the app and scrolled to two days prior. There it was, my neighbor snatching my child right in front of me. I called the police again, and they told me, it's not enough proof to arrest her, and we can't go in because we don't have a warrant. My husband was furious. I, on the other hand, enraged that this lady stole my child, decided I was going to do something about it. I walked over to the neighbor's house and knocked on the door. The lady eventually came to the door and asked, What are you doing here? I told her. I know you have my child. I know you stole those things from me. Give her back now and I won't tell anyone else. She profusely denied everything saying, I don't know what you're talking about. That's when I heard the screams of my child. I pushed the lady aside and ran to the back of the house, where my daughter was with food all over her mouth and clutter everywhere. I said, Come here, sweetheart, we're going home. And that's when I turned around and saw the lady. She was standing there with a knife in her hand. Because we were in a nice neighborhood, this house was very large. I dropped my child and told her, Go run home to dad, tell him I'm here and tell him to call the police. She went off running, but the lady only stared at me. She smiled, but it turned creepy. You've taken an item out of my collection, she said to me. I will punish you for that, and she lunged at me with a knife. I dodged her and made my way through the clutter and mess, getting to the door when the lady came back. You're not getting away this time, she said, slashing at me with the knife. It cut open my arm, and blood started to gush. My screams distracted her, and I punched her in the throat. I rummaged through the massive piles of junk and found a shard of glass. I picked it up and hid it behind my back. The lady was walking toward me again, saying the same things she had before. I pretended to cry, knowing I was about to get the upper hand. She started to taunt me with the knife, and that's when I struck her. The glass shard went right into her neck. I took the shard out, and blood started to spray everywhere. Then, out of nowhere, she stabbed me in the gut. I froze. The pain ruptured through my body. I looked down and took the knife out. Screaming, I took the knife and the glass shard and plunged them into the lady. I blacked out. I woke up in the hospital a few days later. The doctors told me that I had died for over three minutes. I was bewildered and confused. My family came in later and explained who she was. She had been mentally unstable for years, and nobody had said anything about it. As well, my daughter spoke out about what happened to her there, but I won't be speaking about that for her privacy. I am alright now and have luckily moved out of state, 
starting a fresh life and putting this all behind me. We used to live a few doors down from an old creepy guy. I heard that he had been a registered ass offender for CP material of some sort, but was never able to verify that. He was always out walking the neighborhood, sometimes watching the kids on the playground at the nearby daycare, etc. One day, long story short, I had gotten home before my hubby and forgot to lock the door behind me. I heard the alarm chime from an opening door, the dog barked like crazy, but no one was there. I thought it was hubby, but he was leaving his work. I think it may have been that neighbor, honestly. When I was a kid, we had a neighbor who was fairly nice, unless you stepped on his lawn. Or, especially, went into his backyard, you know, when you are kids, a ball or something will go over the fence, and you'll have to jump over and get it. He had all these wires and such strung up all over the yard. And he always took his trash out in the middle of the night. Not out to the curb, but like, he would load large trash bags into his vehicle and drive away, a couple of times a week in the middle of the night. One night, my mom and I were sitting in the living room watching TV, and a bunch of men in black vans arrived at his house. It was the police and the DEA. This dude was running a meth lab inside his house in the middle of a nice family neighborhood one street over from an elementary school. It made sense now why he didn't want anyone on his lawn. He was afraid we would get a closer glance at anything he had in his house. We watched the police brining items and evidence out of his house all night long. It was super cool. It happened around 15. The day was cloudy, yet bright. I have no idea what I just witnessed. My neighbor the other side of the street lives in a rundown house. Not a very old creepy place, would look quite good if taken better care of. But as it stands it has some cracks on the walls, paint peeling off here and there, and lots of overgrowth around it. The neighbor keeps to himself, never heard much noise from there. All is always quiet at my neighbor's home. Yesterday, however, there was a racket. Around 23 or so, I heard pans being thrown, glass breaking, screaming. Afterwards, silence. Today, a car hastily pulled up in front of my neighbor's house. A man ran out of the car, screaming my neighbor's name in a worried tone, a baseball bat in hand. The man started hitting the walls of the residence, yelling for him to come out. Get out of there, man. I'm right outside, just run. He tapped on the windows, knocked on the door, turned around to the street, yelled some more, asking for help. The street is pretty empty at this time, very few cars passing by, nobody went out to check. I just watched from my window. I heard the man scream again, scared. A woman's face suddenly plopped at the window, abnormally large, pale skin, black hair. The man started hitting the bat against the sidewalk, telling the woman to come out, threatening her. He hit the door of the house a few times with a bat. The woman opened it. A long, skinny, spider-like appendage awkwardly beckoned the man in, shyly poking out of the doorway. Not closer, I heard the thing whisper, in a somewhat soothing, ethereal voice. The man screamed for it to stay away. He pleaded for someone to come out and help him. I saw him run down the street, away from the house. Some cars passed by, but paid very little notice to the man. The thing peeked its head outside, it being almost too big to pass through the door. Now, save for some kids playing in the distance, nobody was outside besides the man. Before I could make sense of what was happening, the thing had moved, way too fast to follow. I only saw a silhouette, big, swiftly crawling down the street. The man, almost a block down at this point, got taken. Dead silence. The thing, as fast as it went out, got back inside. The door closed gently. I could only sit there, trying to process what had just happened. Eventually, heavier traffic and pedestrian movement started, commuters getting back from work. Few more people came and went to check on my neighbor's house, knocked on the door, tapped on the windows. The door always opened, the thing always beckoned. They all left, though. All terrified, however. 
The woman had just been peeking outside the doorway. 23, the street is empty. All is quiet at my neighbor's house. My neighbor has been living next door for over six months. In that time, I really haven't heard him at all. He's always been quiet. He doesn't look or act shady. We've talked a couple of times, and I didn't get a creepy vibe, you know. But in the last two weeks, I've been hearing weird noises, and tonight I'm so unnerved and freaked out. Two weeks ago is when I started hearing him. He isn't loud, but I hear him laughing and talking to someone on the phone, maybe. It's not a creepy laugh, just a happy-sounding laugh, like he's in a good mood. I figure the dude finally got a girlfriend or something. Good for him, right? Well, a few days later, I started hearing this weird sound like my air conditioner is on the fritz. The thing is, I hear it even when my air conditioner is off. I eventually found the sound was coming through the wall. It was my neighbor. I didn't manage to find out exactly what the sound was. It sounded like my neighbor was having trouble breathing. I figured maybe he's sick. It's cold as hell out here. Or maybe he and his new girlfriend are getting kinky on the phone. But every day, the breathing sounds louder and weirder. This made me think the dude is seriously ill and getting worse by the day. This isn't really creepy, right? To be honest, it was more annoying than anything, and I actually felt bad for the dude. But last night, I heard something so weird that I'm still not sure I heard it correctly. I was trying to sleep, and I heard the breathing again, only this time it sounded like the guy was on the wall making breathing sounds. That's unnerving. But then I put my ear up against the wall, and I heard the faintest sound of someone tapping on the wall. I know it sounds silly and stupid, but it seriously sounds like someone has their mouth up on the wall, making deep breathing sounds and gagging a bit while they use their finger to tap on the wall. The mental image is stupid, but what else could it be? Today, I bought a stethoscope from Walmart so I could hear better, and that's why I'm a little scared now. I know it's definitely someone breathing and they are up against the wall. The tapping, I'm still not sure what that's about. So, any ideas? I can hear it now, and I'm so tired and want to go to bed, but I'm freaked out. I don't know what it could be or why. I mean, I saw my neighbor today when I left for work, and he was fine, so I don't know. Is there some kind of illness or workout routine I don't know about? At the very least, someone talk to me, please. I loved that neighborhood. It was a small house that I bought in my late 20s. It seems unbelievable now to own a house on your own in your late 20s. But not so long ago, it was even common, still I had to move a little into the suburbs and away from the city, but it was my house. My mother was worried. She said a woman living on her own in the suburbs can be very lonely. I brushed it off. I loved my new house and wouldn't feel lonely. My backyard was small, but I spent that first summer tidying up the backyard and installing several bird feeders. I am a bit of a birder myself. I even had a few birds fly into my open window in this house. It was a mess trying to get them out. Eventually, I got to know several of my neighbors very well. I never thought I would be one of those people, but I would stand next to my front window, just looking at the street, waving to my neighbors, and they waved back. That is until last month. It started off subtle at first. They just stopped waving back, no matter how I smiled or waved to them. Then they started making faces at me, even as I smiled back at them. It didn't matter who it was, even Mrs. Finch stopped waving and smiling at me. Soon the friendliness of the neighborhood was gone. I tried to not let it dishearten me. I still tried to smile and wave as people walked past, but I did not get any more warm responses. Then one day, Mrs. Finch, who had always been friendly with me, knocked in my door and said, I don't care what you do in your home, but I don't appreciate the looks that I get when I walk down the street. I tried to explain that I was just being friendly, but she cut me off. That is not being friendly. When I first moved in, all the neighbors were so welcoming. It seems that has now changed. I tried to not let it get to me. I had planned on being here for a while after all. Then the letters started coming in. Some were short, they would say, leave. 
Other letters would go into details that I was a creep, staring at children as they walk by, making threatening gestures. Those letters sadden me so much I love children, and have only ever smiled at them. I then stopped standing in front of the windows as often, but I was determined to not let my neighbors push me around. Then I got another letter in the mail, this one was much longer. With the front door still open, I kept rereading the same paragraph over. What happens in your home is your business, but your husband should not be making threatening gestures to me and my children when I am walking them to school. If this continues, I'll be forced to call the police. I am not married, what is she talking about? I said aloud, still holding the letter. I was shaken out of my confusion by very sudden and loud creaks above me. They were footsteps, and I could hear them get closer. Then I saw him. It was a man, he was rushing down my stairs holding a knife. He was almost at the landing of the stairs when I finally snapped out of my confused stated and ran out the open front door. I remember screaming and running, but I don't remember much else. Mrs. Field saw me screaming and running. I thought she hated me, but she opened her door for me, hugged me, and rushed me in. She called the police, and then asked me if my husband had attacked me. When the police came, I explained to them that I lived on my own, and that a knife-welding man came down my stairs to hurt me. The police said they searched my entire house, and said they were confident the man was no longer in the house. They said he likely came in my house through one of the open windows. The police also found a manifesto of sorts. The man who was after me apparently did not want to hurt me at first, he just wanted me to leave the neighborhood. I am so sick of you city scum, ruining our beautiful neighborhood. For an entire month, this man had lived in my house, but I don't know how. Whenever I was waving to my neighbors downstairs, he was upstairs making throat-slitting motion with his hands to the same people I was waving at. The letter the man wrote stated that he realized that I wasn't going to leave, and that it was now up to him. If you city people wouldn't be here, I wouldn't have to do this. The police searched and searched my house. They assured me that there was no one in my house. I tried to believe them, I tried to sleep in that house. But that first night after the police left, every sound filled me with terror. I couldn't even make it through the night. At 3 a.m., I left and drove to my mother's. So that man got what he wanted. I no longer live in that neighborhood, and my house is now being put up for sale, but still hasn't sold. It just sits there, vacant. I also no longer wave to my neighbors as they walk by. I am too afraid they won't wave back. Jeremiah Jones is nothing if not the perfect example of the most stressful neighbor you could imagine. A perfectionist with artistic tendencies, however, I suppose he only ever got them because he is so addicted to the need of having everything right and clean at all times. I don't believe he was always like this. Before his wife passed away, you would hardly see him outside at all, except for when he came home from the office in his shiny Volkswagen. And now he has all this time time that he uses for cleaning and renovation, and this almost daily. He's gotten older and stopped working though his retirement money should be more than enough after all those years of work. I'm not sure though. My mother says it is awfully rude to speak about money. Especially other people's money, but that's dumb, it's just paper after all. Maybe being alone and having time is what evoked this hobby or addictive habit of his. Their house was never ugly or dirty when his wife was still there, but she was only out there occasionally. He is far more excessive with his approach. Anyway, Jeremiah Jones was so addicted to perfection that he wouldn't even take a chance of his home having any sign of dirt on the outside. And I mean that quite literally. It's not as if he watches for a bird or a tree to leave a nasty little mark so he can climb up and paint. No, he is constantly taking precautions matters by painting the roof and the walls every single day. Excessive, isn't it? Well, at the beginning, it wasn't that entirely insane just yet. The neighbors even thought that it was a nice habit he had found to distract himself a little. You would see him out there with a big can of blue paint, and he was humming while painting the left side of the building. A few days later, the entire house was blue, and it looked kind of cool. 
An ocean blue home isn't something you see every day. He smiled and he waved when I watched him from our porch. I waved back and even asked if he needed some help, but his smile swiftly disappeared. No, you would just do it all wrong. When I frowned at his words, he picked his smile up again and added, I'm just awfully nitpicky, you know. I nodded and went back inside. The day after he had finished painting it all blue, he was outside again at 5 a.m., when the birds weren't even up just yet. I awoke from the sound of something heavy, loudly hitting the pavement outside our door. I instinctively jumped out of bed and looked out the window to see what it was, and while my mind wasn't that sharp just yet, so early in the morning, I clearly saw blood. It was dripping down the window of Jeremiah Jones, and there was a big puddle of it on the floor next to the house. I screamed and shouted for my parents to call an ambulance. Terrified, they ran to my room, and as the three of us took another look, we realized that what I must have seen was red paint. Our neighbor was outside again, and the sound I heard must have been a can of red paint falling to the ground and spilling paint. The kind that he was using to go over the former blue walls. I suppose he had forgotten to paint a white layer first, as the color certainly didn't look as fresh and bright as the blue of yesterday. It looked messy and dirty. My parents walked outside that morning and talked to him, but I didn't hear what they said. I suppose they told him not to scare me in the morning. Mum was rather furious that he had to start painting so awfully early in the morning. When they came back inside, however, her anger had turned into concern. Poor man must be terribly missing Julie, she whispered. That was his wife's name, Julie Jones. Is this why he's painting so much? I asked her. Mum shrugged. She did love that home, and she always wanted things clean. I suppose it's a tribute. Jeremiah spent the following days going over the walls and the roof until it was bright red, and not rusty red like crusty blood. In the afternoon, when I had just gone inside, I casually walked by and took a sniff of the wall, simply to prove to myself that it didn't smell of iron. I know I was tired in the morning, but I could have sworn I saw blood and not paint. However, all that caught my nose were the chemical scents of layers of paint. The following day, I woke up by sounds from my never-tiring neighbor again. This time nothing was falling, but he was humming a familiar song. I looked outside and when I saw him with another can on the top of his ladder and a color tassel in his hand, I only rolled my eyes and snuggled back into bed. His humming turned into whistling and I didn't get another minute of sleep. In the afternoon, Mum sent me next door with a casserole she had baked earlier that day to make up for her rude attitude towards Jeremiah the day before. She had even talked to other neighbors and many were worried for the old man. Being so lonely and alone, many went over to offer their help or have a chat. He often loudly joined in the chats but never accepted any help. It was his work to do. When I went over with the lasagna that Mum had made, he smiled and climbed down the stairs. Tell your mother thank you, but that wasn't necessary. It must be awfully annoying to live next door to a construction site, he joked. I chuckled. Oh no, that's fine. I really did like the blue, though. The home was now painted in a rather dark color, a mixture of forest green and brown. I thought she would have two, he said in a sad tone, and I assume he meant that his wife would have liked it. I wasn't sure what to say at that moment, so I asked, was blue her favorite color? Mrs. Jones had given me piano lessons when I was younger, and I remembered the wall behind the piano was ocean blue. I thought it was, he said with a half smile, though maybe it's not. He was saying those words as if he had painted the house to please her. Maybe that was what he was trying to do, an act of grievance, and maybe if he found the right color, he would be able to move on. I nodded sympathetically and let him continue with his work. I felt bad for being mad at him. He was only trying to find the perfect color after all. The next day it was yellow, and he had started even earlier in the day when it technically was still night. Yellow was the most unfortunate choice because the dark layer the house currently had wasn't accepting of such a light color, though he didn't seem to care and used up at least a dozen cans of yellow paint before noon. After lunch, I went outside and asked why he didn't put up a layer of ground paint first. 
I wasn't exactly a professional painter, but it seemed logical to me. Because it doesn't matter, he answered in a harsh tone. It will always shine through. Then he proceeded to hum loudly, and I quickly went back home. Sympathy quickly turned into worry when he wouldn't stop for weeks. Every single day he was out there, especially after it rained. What a fortune he must spend on all this paint. He must have sold out every hardware store in town. The layers must be incredibly heavy by now, my father said during breakfast. And it didn't seem as if Jeremiah was even enjoying his work. Dad, how did his wife die? I asked. I knew she had passed away very suddenly, but I didn't know any specifics. Das looked uncomfortable. Well, oon, you see. Mrs. Jones had some health issues, but they weren't physical. He mumbled a few more words, but my father was never good at talking about serious topics. What I could make out of what he said, however, was that she had taken her own life. Inside that house. If Mr. Jones was the one who found her. I suppose that explained his trauma even more. Especially if he never had much time for her. He even spent nights coming home very late from work. I suppose he was trying to make up for things in hindsight. It made me feel even worse for him. However, while his coping mechanism seemed to be helpful at the beginning, it clearly didn't seem healthy anymore. While he used to be happily humming and whistling during his daily activity, it now sounded forced and wrong. He would become louder and more crooked. The song, however, was still the same, and it was loud enough that we could hear it at our kitchen table. The same melody that sounded awfully familiar, but not like something I would usually listen to. Even the song, Dad said as if he was reading my mind. Wasn't that the one Mrs. Jones once taught you on the piano? Black. That was the last color he used on the house. The darkest shade of black I'd ever seen before. He must have ordered it online as it was a new and unfamiliar brand. And while he had been cautiously and carefully painting each day before, he now had lost all motivation to do a clean job. He was splashing and pouring the dark color everywhere. Layers on layers of dark paint dripping from the walls. Neighbors had gathered again. It was evening by then and Jeremiah Jones was still outside with black splashes all over his clothes and face. Some tried talking to the man who looked as if he hadn't been sleeping in days, but he ignored them. If he answered then only by saying nonsense. And that's when I wondered if something else had happened to his wife. Something he had been spared so far because he didn't spend enough time in that cursed home. His wife didn't seem that unwell to me, but I'd only been interacting with her during my piano days, which were a long time ago. However, she was certainly a little nitpicky herself. Possibly the time inside the home alone during those last years had taken a toll on her, and now that he was spending all his time at home, it was getting to her husband. I tried telling my parents, but they only gave me sympathy smiles for talking about a cursed house. Still, I was convinced there was something going on inside that place. And what I saw the night after the house was painted all black proved my suspicions. It was late at night. Mr. Kerb Jones had gone back inside just an hour back, and the whole street seemed to be sleeping. It was eerily quiet as it is most nights on Campbell Street. Most people that live here are rather old and boring and go to bed very soon, so I must have been the only one awake, unable to sleep. Maybe it was because I heard our neighbor hum and whistle each day, but I simply couldn't get that melody out of my brain until I realized it wasn't inside my head. There was a faint melody playing from outside. In the dim street light, the Black Jones house was disappearing into the night. There was no light on the inside that I could see, but there was music playing, very quietly. I'm not sure how to explain my next set of actions. Maybe I was still half asleep and not thinking well enough. But somehow the music got me so incredibly curious that I put on my sneakers and my jacket and walked out to our lawn. The melody was slightly more audible outside, but still very faint. I doubt it was really coming from the inside of the home. I knew Mrs. Jones had given her piano away many years ago, and the sound was not coming from Mr. Jones. I mean, of course, he could have been listening to it online or on CD, 
but I could swear that the music was coming from the walls, not from the inside. I swallowed and took a step closer, now wondering if I was completely out of my mind. I can't quite explain why I felt so drawn to it. Eventually, I had my ear pressed against the outside of the house and immediately moved it away again. As if doing what I was in that moment wasn't dumb enough already, I had forgotten that the house was freshly painted and therefore wet. I rubbed my face, expecting to see black on my hands, but the gooey substance on my skin was something else. This time it really did smell like iron. The walls are bleeding, I whispered to myself, and that's when the window closest to the wall I was standing by opened up wide. The creaking of the wood sent a shiver down my spine, and I fell back to the ground. What are you doing, Mr. Jones hissed. He was trying to be quiet, I could tell, but his eyes were bloodshot and he looked more terrifying than I'd ever seen him before. Do you want to join her? Is that what you'd like? He added. I stumbled back, both afraid and ashamed. I couldn't even explain what I was doing there. I came here almost involuntarily, as if something was calling me. I opened my mouth to say something, but Jeremiah Jones was already grabbing the frame of the window, ready to climb out. The manic expression on his face was only growing worse. I tried to scream, but I was entirely in shock. Our neighbor had always been so kind and polite before the recent events. I was afraid the house had turned him insane. I tried to get up from the dirty ground, but Mr. Jones was almost outside, ready to jump me, and I swear he would have if the commotion hadn't woken someone else up too. Or maybe it was the fact that I wasn't lying in bed as I should have been. But when I heard the footsteps of my parents running towards the lawn and shouting, I was saved. Saved from whatever Jeremiah Jones had planned. More neighbors woke up and the police were there soon. At first, Mr. Jones' explanations were sounding crazy, just as crazy as my idea of a cursed house. It's bleeding. It's bleeding. It's bleeding and singing. She won't stop bleeding. She should have stopped. I will never know how any of what happened was possible. I still wonder if I really heard the music and saw the blood because nobody else seemed to have noticed. Nobody but me and our neighbor. Jeremiah Jones saw the house bleeding each day, which is why he tried to paint over it. Maybe it was a punishment or maybe she tried to warn us and nobody saw, because how could anyone have known that she didn't do this to herself, but that he was the one who made her bleed? My current neighbor moved in, and we decided to be friendly and talk to them. They had a son about 17 years old. Meanwhile, they looked to be 30. We asked them where they moved from, and they said California. We asked why Florida. They said the house. So they never really leave the house, have about zero furniture inside, and their son is a total slave to them. They have him cutting grass with scissors, breaking rocks, stacking rocks, constantly working. The kid never goes to school or leaves the house. The parents are very unfriendly and have had the cops called on them multiple times by myself and neighbors for different things. I called because they were burning trash in the backyard right next to their house. They wouldn't put it out or let the fire department or cops in the back. One night I'm eating dinner with my wife and we hear bloody murder being screamed from their backyard. We go out back and my wife hears someone scream she killed him. So we call the cops and wait until the cops show up and I run in the backyard with the cop. The kid is on the ground next to the pool, bloated and ice cold. Pulseless I should add too. We start CPR and the dad is freaking out and soaked in water and the mom is nowhere to be seen. The fire guys show up with flashlights and say watch out. There's an electrical cord tied around a cinder block in the pool. They transport the kid to the hospital, but the kid was dead already. He just had to be warm and dead. Later that night, the parents ring our doorbell. We don't answer because we have nothing to say to them. They stand there forever and then leave. Then later that night, the cops and fire department are back. They took the mom to the hospital because they found her in the pool shaking uncontrollably and refusing to get out. It was 40 degrees out that night. They come to our house the next day, didn't answer again, but they went to another neighbor saying their kid died, 
and they couldn't live there anymore and needed someone to watch their pets for a while. A couple days later they come back and say they can't move because it's their dream out. Cops came back about two weeks later and took evidence bags from the house, and that's all we know so far. The case is still open. We bought a home and we redecorated it for like three weeks. We thought we were okay with him, but the moment we arrived with our little van to unload our boxes, he called the police on us. Like why? Okay, all parking spots were taken, so we had to put the van in front of our home for 20 men. That's the moment everything started. I gave him my phone number, so when we bothered him by accident, he could text me. But no, we were getting a new kitchen, so we had to remove the old one. Cops again, no text, etc. My husband and me are severely ill, and we need an ambulance every now and then. But there was a parking spot in front of our front door. So because of my husband and me, I arranged with our city hall that the spot would be removed. Workers came, removed the white lines. Again, he called the cops on us and the workers. We got a camera hanging in front because people who can't park are damaging our home with their cars. He called the cops every day well, after he found out there was a cam, one five years after we hung at their LM foul saying that we are spying on him 24-7 air. We do have a life you know lol, he is not that interesting we had the cops over every day for over three months. Until the cops got fed up with it and closed the file. The last one I promise. We were sitting in the backyard, chilling with a book and a glass of wine. He came out and started yelling. Said to his girl he was sorry for the stench in Ho's backyard. So the cops came again. Said that it was offensive to use a fryer at his open window. I'm like what? Come in and have a look. So they came in, looked at our kitchen and asked us. So where is your fryer at? Air, sir. We have none. Weird enough. So, this neighbor wasn't really creepy, just mean and inconsiderate. I'm going to call this neighbor Kevin to protect his identity. Anyways, Kevin was constantly drunk. He has gotten not one, not two, not three, but five or more DWIs. Driving while intoxicated. He would often drive in his side by side to our house and just go pee in the driveway. He has never asked to use our bathroom in the four years we have lived in our house. Kevin was the kind of person who probably had a vocabulary of about a dozen words and made up for it by always cursing. I have never heard him say a sentence without at least one curse word in it. Kevin's dog was never on a leash or chain, but instead was permitted to roam freely without any punishment if it hurt or killed others' animals. I live in a rural community, so I have ducks and chickens. Kevin allowed his dog to go into our other neighbor's house whenever it wanted through their doggy door. He didn't ask if this was all right. He knew that his dog was going there because he would on occasion go to their house and see his dog over there. So, the neighbor's dog had once killed one of our chickens, but they apologized a ton and even asked if we wanted them to put the dog down, which we said no to. But Kevin's dog has very recently came and killed two of our ducks. We have not gotten an apology yet. When we first moved into my house, we had a brief interaction with our new neighbor. In that interaction, we learned that she was really heavily involved with the local vets, assisting them, and we assumed she was a vet nurse. That night, our dog had a really severe reaction to a sting or bite, and I ran next door hoping she could help. She ended up telling me where the local emergency vet was, etc. Fast forward a few days, our dog is fine, and I go next door to thank her for her help with a bottle of wine. She invites me in to meet her dogs, about five very small dogs are cruising around, and she rattled off their names. She then asks if I would like to meet the others at this point. I was thinking, oh lord, this is far too many dogs for this house and she lead me to the kitchen where she pointed out to the top of her cupboard and started telling me the name of each and every urn on there. There were about 25 urns. She offered to look after our dog any time we need. I politely declined. When I still lived at home, we had an incident. 
We had a huge garden with my father's garage and workshop and a tool shed in it. One morning my father realized that the roof window of the garage was broken and some of his chainsaws had been stolen. This meant someone had walked on the garage roof and broken in. Police took a look, but nothing happened. Then some months later we discovered another broken glass. We had glass covering the heating system for our pool. This glass was right at the border to our neighbor's garden, so someone must have stepped on it. We couldn't t make sense of it. Our neighbors were an elderly couple. Then years later, my father realized that these neighbors had a son who was a criminal and a drug addict who happened to live with them at the time period when the break-in happened. Suddenly, the strange footprint-like hole in the glass made perfect sense since he must have climbed over from the other garden. At that time, the neighbors had already moved out, and their son is dead or in jail now, I think. Still a creepy memory to think about some guy sneaking around there at night. Neighbors came to the house to ask my father if I'd stay at their place while they went on a weekend away to watch their house. The goal was to ask me in person, but I wasn't home so they asked him to ask me. My mental health isn't the best, and I was going through a bad bout, so he told them no. They then somehow got it in their heads that if they asked me in person 20 half at the time, they could pressure me into saying yes, they were like 50 and older. What followed was a week of me absolutely avoiding them because I was super uncomfortable with how they wouldn't take no for an answer. Beforehand, they would be at the door literally every other day for a favor, while we never asked them for anything so it was all a bit much, especially considering this was the first time saying no after over a year of doing them a bunch of significant favors. It culminated in the husband coming round the day before they were set to leave, having been told no a load of times, hammering away on the door. I ignored it. So he started screaming my name through the letterbox, as if knowing it was him would make me rush to the door and jump to find out what he needed now. Most annoying part was he waited till my dad's car wasn't in the driveway to do this because he knew full well how inappropriate he was being. My dad came home at the tail end of it and was like, ooh, she's already told you no. And the guy was just like, oh I know, but, well, um. I never did anything for either of them again after that, and they glare at me whenever they see me. We had a new neighbor move in next door, and we got chatting to them. They said they had to move because they had problems with their neighbors in the previous house. Less than a week later, they're banging on the door yelling at us to move the car from the public road outside their house that wasn't even ours. It was not blocking their driveway, and was parked normally. I was working under my car one day in my driveway with the stereo on and heard a noise. I popped my head out to find her deep in the middle of a conversation with me that I'd missed the start of. I asked her what she wanted, and she went off ranting about the cars outside her house again. I told her they're not ours, anyone on our street can park anywhere on the road. She said she was going to put her bills through our letterbox, and that we had to pay them until we moved the car. I told her that's not how it works, and went back to working on my car. My sister also mentioned to me that she once told my sister that the squirrels were trying to get her. This man lives with his dad and mom, even though he had a son, but what was weird about them was every now and then you could hear screaming from their house. Luckily for us, the cops were called. They found out the man was attacking his child while he was high on meth and drawing blood from the kid. Me and my family never saw the dad again, and the kid might be fine now, don't know cause I moved. But I know for sure I am not going to live near that neighborhood again. We live in an apartment on the sixth floor. Our next door neighbor did a renovation in our apartment for the previous owners around 1997. We moved into this apartment in 2000 and started our own renovation in 2008, a few months before the global financial crisis. It was a complete renovation, so we needed to rent and live in another place. The 2008 crisis froze our renovation process for a year. 
while we were living in another apartment, we kept receiving electricity bills for our main apartment, which was empty with exposed wires. When we managed to continue our renovation, our electrician discovered that one of our sockets had a connection to our neighbor's apartment. This neighbor had plugged a network filter into this socket, which provided electricity to half of his apartment. We paid for that for almost nine years, nearly a thousand dollars a year, and the previous owners paid for it for a few years as well. As we were relatively wealthy at that time, my parents didn't do anything about it. My mom told me about it, and we just laughed. So my aunt lives next door to us, which would be all fine and dandy, but she's a sociopath. The house we live in was hers and my father's growing up, and we, dad, mom, brother, me, moved in with my grandmother ten years ago. My aunt would come get my nan's keys to fill her car with gas and copy the house key. My aunt would then come into our house in the wee hours of the morning and steal the stupidest shit. We didn't notice for a while, but then our new shampoo bottles would be empty suddenly. Our paper towels and toilet paper would be gone. Our food, silverware, and cups would be gone. Then my mom's jewelry would be on the stairs coming down from the bedroom like it was dropped on the way out. One morning I was wide awake around 2.30 a.m. for some reason, and I heard what I assumed was one of my parents coming upstairs going in their bedroom across the hall, then a few minutes later going back downstairs. The dog's tail was wagging and hitting the floor, so I wasn't scared until the next morning when my parents asked if I was up late that night and came in their room. The thing was she didn't sneak up or tiptoe or anything straight up stomped up the stairs and down the hall. She had done this many times, and my dog was used to her coming and was the shittiest guard dog ever. We then changed the locks and put a special coated door for the staircase. Since she couldn't go upstairs to watch us sleep anymore, she would come around 5, 6 in the morning, just before my mom and I got up for school. Our alarms would go off at 5.45 a.m. on the weekdays, and we would hear the front door slam shut. And if we ran to the windows, we would see her going back to her house. We changed the locks again, and the night visit seemed to stop. I could go on with more messed up shit she did to us, but this is long enough. Update. So, more on her, when I was about 10, it was close to Valentine's Day, and she told me this was the last holiday that she was going to give me candy, because I was getting fat and the whole family was concerned for my health. Also, whenever we went on vacation, we would have to lock up all of our valuables. Purses, paintings, furniture, and when we got back, several knick-knacky things would be gone. One time, a painting my grandfather gave my dad was gone, and we were really pissed about that. We knew she had been in the house because a family picture of my mom's would be on the floor or face down on the mantel. Eventually, my grandmother got Alzheimer's, and when my nan first went to the hospital, she gave my aunt her wedding rings, and those are long gone. Bitch never gave them back. Absolutely heartbreaking to explain over and over to my grandmother that her own daughter stole her wedding rings. When my aunt visited Nan, she would pilfer through all her drawers and stole anything and everything of value. One day I was helping my grandmother get dressed and she cried because she didn't have any more jewelry because my aunt stole it. Another morning while my grandmother was quickly succumbing to Alzheimer's, my aunt came over at 5 a.m. to give her coffee, which we had already done. I'm super hammered right now, and I hope that made sense. Thanks for the brief internet fame, my most popular post so far. Update 2, since many of you asked about involving the cops. We never had enough proof. It could have been anybody coming into my house from a legal standpoint. But it wasn't. Yeah, no. Also, some more messed up shit. When my grandmother did die, my aunt fought us for nearly two years over an old, run-down set of seven apartments my parents had took care of for the, the past 30 years. Finally settled with a huge check to her, and she's calmed down since because she can't swindle more money out of us. She now has a life-size cardboard cutout of Matt Demon in her window staring at us. I can't get a good picture of it or I will show it. Thanks guys, at least my mildly shitty childhood is fascinating now. I used to live in a three-story house with my parents, younger sibling, and our dog. We moved into this house a few months before my younger sibling was born, and that was when we first met the neighbors across the street. Lucas, who was the oldest child in their family, was always a bit strange. 
But there were some aspects of his personality that were more than just strange. They were straight up disturbing. It would take hours to cover everything, so I'm just going to get straight to the point. I'm almost positive that Lucas has been inside of our house in the middle of the night. Our house was built on a hill, so it looked like it was only two stories from the front, and the basement was connected to the backyard. The yards in this neighborhood were much larger than they are in newer housing developments, so it would have been very easy for someone to enter our backyard unnoticed. Despite this, my family was terrible about making sure all of the basement doors were locked. My younger sibling and I would always go in and out when we were playing in the backyard, or someone would go down to let the dog out, and we would end up forgetting to lock one of the doors before bed. We also lived in a safe area where it was common for people to leave their doors unlocked. However, my family did always lock the door leading down to the basement every night, along with all of the other doors on the main level of the house. I had a messed up sleep schedule back then, so I would usually still be awake at 3 or 4 in the morning. There are two specific instances that happened very late at night which make me think that Lucas has been inside of our house without our knowledge. One night, I was in my bedroom on the upper level of the house. It was probably around 2.30 in the morning when I suddenly heard the sound of an angry growl coming from downstairs. Thinking that my dog had spotted a cat in the front yard, I quickly rushed downstairs to stop him from barking and waking up my entire family. This kind of thing would happen every now and then, so I wasn't thinking too much of it at the time. But instead of going downstairs and finding my dog by the front window, I found him by the locked door that leads down to the basement. The fur on the back of his neck was standing up, and his nose was pressed to the bottom of the door. I instantly froze when I realized what was happening. There was something or someone on the other side of the basement door. I was barely a teenager at the time, so I began to panic and started making my way upstairs as quietly as possible. I woke up both of my parents, but neither of them took me very seriously. My dad just assumed that my dog was hearing random noises coming from outside, but he did eventually go down to check things out. He said that everything downstairs looked normal, but he also mentioned that we forgot to lock one of the basement doors that night. Then there was another time that I was up late and in my room. But this time, instead of hearing my dog growling, I heard a loud bark that echoed through the entire house. The sound was sudden and intense, similar to a gunshot, and it almost made me jump out of my chair. Assuming again that my dog had seen a cat outside, I quickly looked out of my bedroom window and tried to spot whatever he was barking at. But my heart suddenly dropped when instead of seeing a cat, I saw Lucas running out of our front yard in the pitch black. I watched him run across the street and back towards his own house before I rushed to close the curtains and duck out of sight. I remember sitting there struggling to process what I had just seen and questioning why Lucas would be in our yard in the middle of the night. I told my mom about it the very next morning and she said that she would bring it up to Lucas's mom. Because of these two instances, and because of other details that I can't include, I'm 99% sure that Lucas has been inside of our house in the middle of the night. If you knew the entire story behind this family, then you would also find the thought of this to be extremely disturbing. I do want to mention that this all happened years ago. My family no longer lives in that house, and those neighbors across the street are doing fine. But looking back on everything now, I'm realizing just how creepy the situation truly was. When I lived with my ex, we would hear a lot of footsteps in a wooded area behind his home. One day we were checking out at the register at a little shop down the street, and the cashier mentioned some items on a shelf that my ex had. I think they were talking about anime and my ex had some characters above his gaming station on the wall. It was disturbing. We had always attributed the footsteps to being wild boars, but after that conversation we realized that the cashier may have been living in the darkest part of the yard. It started at 4.43 a.m. The noise jolted me awake. It sounded like there was a giant truck revving its engine right there in our bedroom. Exhaust fumes wafted in through the open window. It was a bad way to start the day. What is that? moaned my wife. We both slept poorly because our daughter had crawled into our bed at 1 a.m. and kept kicking us in the face until we were both half hanging off the bed while she snored away. Start of the apocalypse, I groaned. Go back to sleep. No way can I sleep through that racket, said Vanessa. 
She rolled out of bed and shut the window. That helped a little, but it still sounded like war out there. She pulled the curtains back and looked through the window. It's the neighbor, mowing his lawn, before the sun is up. We need to have a heart to heart with him. Let him know that's not okay. Keegan, our daughter, woke up crying. Guess that's that, I muttered, getting out of bed myself. I'll go talk to him after some coffee. Bring me some too, said Vanessa. Papa, bring me some Smarties, said Keegan. No, no Smarties for breakfast. Banana or toast, but not Smarties. Fine, huffed Keegan. Toast, cut into shapes. I sighed. This was really the last thing I wanted to be doing at 4.45 on a Saturday morning. Making coffee and cutting toast into animal shapes instead of drooling in my sleep and dreaming of a gentler world. I went into the kitchen and started the coffee and toast and then looked out the living room window. Sure enough, there was Mr. Limsky, mowing his damn lawn, in his damn bathrobe, no less. That was another thing that I had no desire to do. Get into it with him about this, or really talk to him about anything ever beyond a friendly wave and a howdy neighbor. By the time I was awake enough to form a coherent thought, it was almost six, and I had consumed four cups of coffee. Mr. Limsky was still at it which was strange because his yard isn't very big at all. It shouldn't take more than a 40-minute mound job, but here it was an hour and 15 minutes later and he was still at it. I got semi-dressed and stumbled outside. I walked across my own yard, which I noted needed mowing itself. Maybe I'll tell him that if he mows my lawn and promises to never start so early again, I'll let it go. But I knew that I wouldn't do that. I was a coward. As I got closer, I observed with some confusion that his lawn was already mowed. He was going over it a second time now. I walked up to our property line, denoted by the contrast between mowed and unmowed grass, and started waving my hands in the air, waiting for Mr. Limsky to notice me. He never did. He just stared straight ahead and kept pushing the mower. Hey, I shouted, but it was no good. I could barely hear myself, and so I knew that he wouldn't be able to hear me from across the lawn, right behind the lawnmower. God damn it. I walked across his yard until I was right behind him. Hey, nothing. I tapped on his shoulder. Nothing. He just kept pushing the lawnmower onward over the already mowed lawn. I didn't know what to do. I'll catch him after he finishes, I guess. He's in the zone. I shrugged and was getting ready to turn back to my house when I saw a trickle of what was presumably urine run down his bare leg. Jesus. I went back to my house and opened the door. Vanessa was reading a book to Keegan. She stopped when I came in and looked up. Well? Hey. Hmm. He couldn't hear me. I'll go over there once he stops. He's got to stop sometime, right? And, um, well, I'm a little worried about him honestly. I saw him, you know, wet himself. Mr. Limsky peed his pants? Asked Keegan. She started laughing. Well, that sometimes happens, kiddo, I said. You used to do that. We do that a lot when we're kids, and then we don't do it for a while, and then when we get older, we sometimes do it again. That gave her something to think out anyway. Hmm, said Vanessa. There's more, I said. He's already done with the lawn. He's just going over it a second time. Maybe he missed a few spots? Nope, it's perfect. Not a blade of grass higher than any other blade of grass. Hmm, said Vanessa. That is strange. Do you think he's okay? Should we call somebody? I shrugged. Who are we going to call? The police. Tell them that our retired neighbor is mowing his lawn twice while piss. While peeing himself. What will they say to that? By eight, I was done cooking the bacon, and Mr. Limsky was still at it, mowing his lawn for what must have been the fifth time. I tried not to think about it, but it was hard. After breakfast, we should go somewhere, I said. It's a beautiful day. No sense staying cooped up all day. Why does Mr. Limsky keep mowing his lawn? Asked Keegan. I don't know, kiddo, I muttered. I don't know. You want to go to the playground or something? Yeah, I'm going to stay here and try to go back to sleep if that's okay, said Vanessa. Of course, I said. I felt like going back to sleep myself, even after all that coffee. But the desire to get far away from the sound of the lawnmower outweighed my tiredness. We ate, and Keegan and I headed to the playground. At nine. Zero, I got a text from Vanessa. Can't sleep. 
He's still mowing. 9.30. I'm really starting to get worried. This isn't normal. 10. Zero. I went over there and tried to talk to him, but it's like he's in a trance. Please come home. I sighed but complied. I rounded up the kid and drove home. I felt a deep sense of unease that grew more intense the closer I got to home. You're afraid of an old man mowing the lawn? I chided myself. It didn't work because my instinctive answer was, yes. I turned onto my street and prayed that Mr. Limsky would be done mowing the lawn by now. He'd tell us it was just a practical joke and we'd all have a good laugh over it. But soon enough I saw that wasn't going to happen. As I pulled into my driveway, I saw that he was still out there. I thought I saw a streak of brown running down his leg, but it was hard to tell for sure because he was going around under the shade of his ancient apple tree. I walked inside and Vanessa was at the kitchen table with bags under her eyes and a glass of wine in front of her. Please make it stop, she said. I don't know how to do that, I said, suddenly feeling very tired and in need of a drink myself. Call the police, she said. Why don't you, I asked. Fine, she said. It's just that I do everything else around here, so I thought maybe you could help this one time. I held my tongue. I did plenty around there, but I knew that now wasn't the time to point that out. Okay, I said. I'll call the police. How's he not run out of gas by now anyway? I've been watching him, said Vanessa. He's got a can of gas in his driveway. Sometimes he grabs it when he passes by and gasses up while still pushing the mower. It's crazy. Please call the police. All right, all right, I said. I looked up the number and proceeded to have one of the most awkward phone conversations of my life. It was ten minutes with the receptionist and then another ten minutes with an officer. Finally, they agreed to come over and check it out. Fifteen minutes later, I watched out the window as the cop car pulled into Mr. Limsky's driveway. A single cop got out and walked over to Mr. Limsky. The cop was waving his hands and shouting, but it was no good. Then the cop grabbed Mr. Limsky's shoulder and spun him around forcefully. This caused Mr. Limsky to finally let go of the throttle, and for the first time all day, the lawnmower stopped moving. It was still running, though, because he had taped its safety shut off down. I held my breath as I waited to see what would happen next. Mr. Limsky opened his mouth, and something emerged from it. It looked like a long, thin tentacle. The tentacle wrapped itself around the cop's neck and lifted him up into the air, Then a second tentacle emerged from Mr. Limsky's mouth and made it way down the cop's throat. I slammed the curtain shut and noticed that I, too, like Mr. Limsky earlier, had wet myself. What's going on out there? asked Vanessa from the kitchen. Did the police arrive? I didn't have a good answer, so I didn't say anything. Honey, said Vanessa, walking over, are you okay? From outside, we heard the whine of a new machine join in with the lawnmower. Vanessa opened the curtain, and I turned slowly to look out. The cop was out there going around the old apple tree with a weed whacker while Mr. Limsky was back pushing the lawnmower around again. It's 5 p.m. Besides Mr. Limsky, there are now four cops in his yard doing various tasks. One is still at it with the weed whacker. Another has been going at the shrubs with a pair of clippers for hours now. But the one who concerns me the most is the one who is going around spraying the ground from a bottle full of neon blue liquid that Mr. Limsky at one point puked out of his mouth. I personally am petitioning the family to pack up the car and start driving to Florida where Vanessa's mother lives. I have no idea what is going on, but it doesn't look good. Part 2 I wasn't sure what was more bizarre and terrifying. My neighbor mowing his lawn for the 13th straight hour aided by four uniformed cops performing various other landscaping tasks. Or the woman in the gas mask and plastic poncho that emerged from the tan Toyota Camry which had wrapped itself around Mr. Limsky's apple tree. Damn it, Kelly! She shouted through the mask, clearly and steady on her feet after the crash. No more driving for you, ever. I crouched down in my driveway behind my own car which I had just finished loading in preparation for getting my family far away from whatever horrible thing was happening next door. I watched as the woman who was not impressed by Kelly's driving skills pulled a large blaster from under her poncho. That's the best way I can describe it. It wasn't a gun. It was a blaster. The woman pointed her blaster at Mr. Limsky and pulled the trigger. That was it for Mr. Limsky. 
He exploded in a horrible mess of neon blue gore. A still writhing tentacle flew through the air and slapped against the windshield of the Camry. I saw the wipers go on in an effort to clear the thing away. I turned and saw my wife looking out the window of our house in horrified amazement. She had her hand over our daughter's eyes. Keegan was prying away at Vanessa's finger in order to get a look at the excitement. Me. I'd had enough excitement for the day. I had no idea who the blaster woman was, but I knew that she had a blaster, and I struggled to come up with some way to get my family out of there without drawing anybody's notice. The woman turned her blaster to each of the four cops in turn and quickly reduced them into four gooey globs of neon blue slime. If I can just get back inside without her noticing me, we can slip out the back and uber it out of Dodge. Doesn't matter where, just somewhere far away. You, shouted the woman. Her poncho was absolutely drenched with the insides of the things she'd just blown apart. Hiding behind your car, stand up slowly, Shit. I stood up with my hands in the air. Please don't blast me, I said. I'm not one of them, I swear. We'll see about that, she said. Meanwhile, your neighbor, Mr. Limsky, he lived alone, yes? That's right, I said. His wife died last year. Poor guy. I looked over at the puddle of strange gore that used to be Mr. Limsky. Poor guy indeed? Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go inside Mr. Limsky's house and get cleaned up. You're going to go inside your house and wait there for us. If you try anything smart, I promise you that you'll end up like your neighbor here. Not a pretty sight, you agree? I took one more look, fought back the urge to puke, and nodded my head in earnest agreement. Same goes for your family. I see them through the window. Got it? Inside? No? I didn't need any more encouragement. I ran back inside my house. Back to Vanessa and Keegan. Who is that? asked Vanessa. What's going on? You think I know? I snapped. Then I sighed. I don't, but I think maybe she's a good guy. I mean, she blasted those things out there. What if Mr. Olimsky was the good guy? asked Keegan. What if there are no good guys? asked Vanessa. I don't know, I said. I don't know, but I think we have to take that chance. If she's a bad guy, then we're done, then it's bad, no matter what we do, I think. So I think we just have to think positively about this, and hope that she's a good guy. Think. Positively, said Vanessa. Think positively. How about we think about survival? I gritted my teeth. That's what I'm saying, dear. I think that our best chance at survival is to stay put and talk things over nicely with the lady in the gas mask. What's survival? asked Keegan. It's what we're all trying to do, kiddo, I explained on a day-to-day -day basis, and none of us will finally pull it off. What? It means trying not to die, I said. Are we going to die? Someday, kiddo. Someday a long, long time from now. I wasn't sure about that, of course, but what else could I say? Hey, you want to watch Tumble Leaf? Fig the Fox? Okay, said Keegan. I got an episode going and then went into the kitchen where Vanessa was pacing around in a circle. Are you sure about this? she asked, waiting here for them to come to us. No, I said. Okay, she said, I trust you, and I love you. I love you too, I said. We waited. Twenty minutes later I saw them approaching my house. There were two women and one man, each wearing a gas mask. The woman in front was still carrying her blaster, but she had cleaned all of the blue substance off of her and was wearing some of Mr. Limsky's clothes. I met them at the door. Did any of you come into contact with any of them? asked the woman in front. No, I said. It was a lie. I had come up behind Mr. Limsky and tapped him on the shoulder. Vanessa had also approached him. What is this about? Kelly, said the blaster lady to the woman behind her. Test him. This Kelly pulled a large syringe out of her backpack and took a step toward me. Now wait a minute here, I said. You're not going to stick me with that needle until you tell me why I should let you. What is going on? You can submit to the test, said Blaster Lady, or we can presume that you have the virus and terminate you. Well, then I'll submit to the damn test, I said, rolling up my sleeve and offering out my arm. Not there, said Kelly. 
a second before she jammed the syringe into the side of my head. F, that hurts. Kelly pulled the needle out. Then she went into her backpack again and brought out a test tube filled with a green fluid. She unscrewed the tube and shot some of my brain juice into it. Then she put the lid back on, shook it, and held it up to the light. He's clear, said Kelly. Now for his family, said Blaster Lady. I watched in helpless horror as Kelly jammed a giant needle into first my wife's head and then my daughter's head. Keegan couldn't stop crying and it made me sick to my stomach. They're all clear, said Kelly. We're clear, I said. Now, do you want to tell us just what the F is going on? Let's start with who the hell you all are. I'm Kelly Raymond, said the one with the needle. My boyfriend got turned into a zombie, like Mr. Limsky, but a little different. I had to keep cutting off his fingers. Hey, zombie, I said. You had to keep cutting off his fingers. Of course. You can call me Allie, said Blaster Lady, taking off her gas mask. The others did as well. And yes, zombies. They are real. And the virus is growing stronger and more unpredictable by the day. Okay, I said. Zombies. I looked to the man in the group. And you are... Martin Henwood, said the man. I was a former colleague of your neighbor before he retired. Ah, uh, I said. Mr. Limsky was a coroner, I want to say. Mortician, said Martin, and he was a true artist, which is why I had to call him out of retirement for my latest job. Martin was obviously upset and fighting back tears, but he went on. A body came in for burial. The dead woman had apparently murdered her boyfriend in a particularly brutal way. There were rumors that the necklace she still wore, even after her supposed autopsy, was cursed. It was a strange case indeed, because for starters, I saw no sign that an autopsy was ever performed. I suspected that the medical examiner had gotten spooked by the rumors and had opted to rule the death a self-kill without actually cutting into the body. Then, too, as I looked her over, I saw that the necklace had no clasp. There was no way to get it off without cutting it off. I had the worst headache of my life, but I tried to stay focused. Let me guess. The necklace made her a zombie? We think that's the case, said Allie. Tell him what happened next, Martin. Martin cleared his throat. Well, I thought the whole matter was nonsense. A cursed necklace. I'm a man of science, not superstition. Or I was. When I started the embalming process, that's when I began to think twice. What came out of the body was not any kind of blood that I have ever seen in my 25 years of experience. It was... I finished up for him. Neon blue. Just so, said Martin. And that's when I called Chuck Limsky. He had never encountered anything like that before, either and in fact didn't believe me. He wanted to see for himself, so he came over and I showed him the body. Like me, he was both fascinated and baffled. He wanted to spend some time with the body, so I left to get us sandwiches. When I got back, Chuck was standing in the moor, dripping with blue slime, and the body was gone. What happened? I asked. It, it exploded, he said. The body just exploded? Mm. I have to go home and clean up, but I'll be right back. I've never seen anything like this. He left, and that was the last I saw of him until Martin trailed off and broke down into sobs. We caught up with Martin shortly after, said Allie. We had heard about the case of the necklace girl and thought it smelled strongly of zombie. Martin told us what had happened and brought us to Mr. Limsky's house, and now here we are in your living room. What about the necklace? I asked fighting back the thousands of thoughts, fighting for control of my mind. Where did it come from? How does it turn you into a zombie? That's one of the things we're going to find out, said Allie. We have it with us, and are going to run it through a variety of tests. Typically, the virus is spread in the usual ways, like somebody coughing on you, or uh, exploding on you. The necklace is a new development. We are seeing a lot of new developments. We have been dealing with the basic zombie virus for some time now, and containing it well. But now, now things have changed. Our ultimate goal is to find a vaccine for the new super strains. But first we need to fully understand what we're up against. I looked over to the couch across the room where Keegan was sitting on Vanessa's lap, still watching Fig the Fox. Vanessa was listening intently to our hushed talk, and I could see the terror etched into her face. I'm sure it was etched into mine as well. 
It's not safe for you here anymore, said Allie. The people I work with, used to work with. Yes, they are concerned about the zombies, but they are just as concerned with people finding out about the zombies. They are ruthless and will be here within a day or so. Besides, we need a new ride since Kelly wrecked our car. She's never allowed to drive again. I happen to notice that you have a nice, roomy SUV out there. That could fit us all, and it will. We'll rest up for a few hours. Then we'll torch Mr. Limsky's property. Then we hit the road. It's up to you. Come with us, or stay behind for them to find you. All right, I said. Let me talk it over with my wife. We're on the road now. Allie's driving. I'm obviously not going to say where we're going. I just wanted to let everyone know that the zombie apocalypse is coming if we don't get there in time. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.